if it's not on the same page in your Bible, I assume it's not, also Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 4. While you're finding it, let's uh, remember a few things that we looked at yet last week. Last week as we were looking at, our, in our series on prayer, we were looking at Jesus in the garden. And as Jesus was getting prepared to be taken, and he had just had the Lord's Supper with his disciples, and went with them, they followed him, they were out on a nighttime stroll, went to the garden, and he had his disciples remain there, and took with him Peter, James, and John. When he went into the garden, he asked them to tarry and to watch with him in prayer. And he went, and he was in great agony, he began to be in great agony, and went by himself to pray, and prayed and requested about the cup that he was going to have, that he was um, asking if it's God's will for it to pass from him. The Bible says later on in the scripture that God granted his prayer, and um, he came back and found his disciples sleeping, and he woke them up, and he said, you should watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. In the context there, right before that, Jesus had told his disciples that they were going to deny him. And Peter said, Lord, he said, though I die, I won't deny you. And the other disciples said the same thing. And Peter and Jesus said, Peter, by the time the cock crows three times, you'll have denied me three times, you'll deny me thrice. And so Peter is in great danger of entering into temptation. And we saw that in, the, in our text that it is easier for a man to die than it is for a man to live for Jesus. And you know, that is an interesting thing for us to understand. They, uh, come into the garden. Judas comes with the uh, betrayers and comes to take the, who come to take Jesus. And Judas betrays him with a kiss. And Peter takes out his sword and he's ready to die. And Jesus said, "Put up your swords." So they live by the sword, or die by the sword. And he explained to him that his, if his kingdom wasn't of the world, if it was of the world, then his servants would fight. And so uh, we saw from our text last week that the importance of prayer in order to keep us from failing uh, spiritually and how that though we may be ready to die yet Peter to preserve his own life a week later or I mean a, a day later denied the Lord Jesus and how important prayer is at times of temptation and we saw from our text Jesus had warned his disciples about that same temptation it wasn't something that crept in on them with no warning you know that's the same is true for us do you think uh, that God with regard to our living in this life just kind of throws us out to chance and lets things happen with no warning, no kind of preparation? No, not at all. Instead, God does prepare us by circumstances and things in life. And you'll find that practically speaking, many times we have warnings even before our times of testing of things to come and we have preparations. We need to learn the necessity of continuing and tarrying in prayer in those kind of a situation because indeed it is easier to die than it is to live for Jesus. Dying simple, like we said last week, everybody does it. Everybody's done it up to this point and um, anyone can do it. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm afraid to die. Well, no need to fear. If you don't get taken by the rapture, you'll die and you'll handle it just fine. You'll do it. You'll get through it. No question. Everybody always has. And so death is not a thing that individuals that have life everlasting fear at all. But living for Jesus now is another thing altogether and requires prayer. And how many times do we obey the part of the Lord's Prayer that requires us to pray, Lord, uh, deliver us from temptation. Lead us not into temptation, and, but deliver us from evil. And that ought to be a regular part of our life on a daily basis. You ought to pray it for yourself, and you ought to pray it for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, let's read our text this evening, and I'll ask as we read our text that you would look to see what these two passages that we're going to read this evening have in common, then we'll draw some application from them. We'll begin in chapter 1 and in verse 20, and this, of course, is speaking of Judas and his betrayal and how that he uh, threw the money down in the, uh, in the field that was bought and that they call Asodama, that is the field of blood. And the, the, the psalm is, uh, is quoted here. Verse 20 of chapter 1 in Acts says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric let another take. 
Wherefore of these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Here is just a simple qualification for an apostle. Judas has been, um, of course, is going to have his bishopric taken, and the apostles are in a time of prayer, and they're going to ask God for guidance with regard to this matter of an apostle. And they recognize that this person who's going to be given this post has qualifications that he must meet. Well, they appointed two in verse 23, Joseph called Bersabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And down in verse 1 of chapter 2, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, went, all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That speaks of the devout Jews dwelling in Jerusalem out of every nation who heard the gospel preached in their own language. And the end result is in the end of the chapter that uh, the, in verse uh, 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and unto the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he, then in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his words were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, if you will, turn with me over to chapter 4. And this is regarding Peter and John healing the impotent man or the lame man. And they've been called into question about it. And the problem that the religious rulers in this council, which was responsible for killing Jesus, had was that a notable miracle had been done and they couldn't deny it. And there was just, there, it, was, it was a dangerous thing at this point, especially from their perspective, to cry, try to kill the disciples of Jesus because they tried to kill Jesus and God raised him from the dead. And that since then they haven't succeeded in killing anyone else. They haven't tried. And I don't know about you, but it would be demoralizing to me to kill somebody and have them come back from the dead. <laughs> and so they're thinking twice, I believe, before they kill Peter and John, just because um, they, they, they've come to the understanding they can't kill someone if God raises them from the dead. And so here's the result of it. In uh, verse, uh, let's look at verse 21. So when they, they commanded him not to speak in verse 18, any art at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And so Peter's reply to them with regard to not preaching Jesus is, well, do you, you know, should we listen to you or should we listen to God? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So he says what their answer is. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. What was done? Well, these mighty acts of the outpouring of the power of God's Holy Spirit but not just that, the resurrection was what was done. And it was undeniable, and it's just, it's in everybody's mind. It's the most recent thing. See, when Jesus uh, was risen from the dead, historians today, uh, individuals who try to deny the resurrection, they try to deny that, you know, it was a commonplace thing, it was just a staged thing by Christians. The fact is that if you'll study uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you'll see the account of it, there were over 500 brethren at one time that saw the resurrected Lord and Savior. And 500 people seeing a resurrected person, news gets around. And of course, he was 40 days with his disciples and taught them and spoke of the things regarding the kingdom. And, and that's just currently spoken of in Acts chapter 1. And so there's some big happenings with regard to God's ability, God's power in Jerusalem. And these individuals recognize that they can't stop whatever's happening, and they're trying to figure out how to do quality or damage control here. And so they couldn't find a way to punish Peter and John simply because they realize you can't kill people unless God allows you. And they really, I think, realize that more 
uh, than we probably give them credit for now. And, and they're just hard-hearted unbelievers. So now, uh, in